Well, for more on the issue of reparations for slavery in the U.S., I'm joined by Julianne Malveau, author, labor economist, and political commentator. Thank you for being here. Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. So let's get back to what sparked the resurgence of this conversation around reparations in the U.S. Well, reparations legislation has been around since 1989. Congress and John Conyers first introduced H.R. 40 for the 40 acres and a mule that was promised and never uh, was materialized in 1989 and reintroduced it for every Congress since then. Most recently in 2017, when it went from a reparations study bill to a reparations recommendations bill. Uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, upon Congressman Conyers' um, resignation from Congress, a Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee from Texas took it up, and of course we just had a recent set of hearings um, in Washington on, on the Hill about reparations. But organizations have been, from the time of the end of enslavement, people have been talking about this. I think the most recent impetus is a function of the conversations about the wealth gap. We've seen um, members of Congress, we've seen Bernie, Elizabeth Warren, many of the key candidates, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, talking about you know, the wealth gap and the origins of the racial wealth gap are enslavement and its aftermath. Not just enslavement, but we also have to pay attention to the aftermath, to the economic terrorism that existed. If you look at 1880, the ratio of black wealth to white wealth, blacks had $1 for every $36 that whites had. But by 1910, that had dropped to $1 for every $16. In other words, black people were making progress. Then you had this rash of Jim Crow laws passed, lynchings that most people think lynchings were about sex, but they weren't. They're about economics. Black people owning businesses, black people trying to unionize, uh, trying to organize as farmers. And so we can look at the enslavement period, but look at the rest of it. People were actively discouraged from accumulating wealth. And that's why the reparations issue is so important. So uh, then, and, and obviously it's important enough that we're seeing it coming up in these presidential debates. So talk about the candidates who support the idea and what their solutions are on really moving this conversation into implementation. Well, uh, Senator Cory Booker introduced uh, Senate Bill 10, I think it's 1083, uh, which would be the companion to the Sheila Jackson Lee Bill HR 40. And most of the senator, senatorial candidates have agreed to support his legislation. Most, not all. Uh, Bernie's not sure. Um, but see, these pieces of legislation merely establish a commission and do a study. And no one is saying, let's write checks. Right. Um, lots of people want to see a check written. I happen to be part of an organization called NARC, the National African American Re Reparations Commission, which is part of the Institute of the Black World. And while we support uh, check writing, we also think that it's more than that, because communities have been damaged. Once upon a time, we had more than 100 black-owned banks. Now we have 23. Uh, how come? And so those are some of the kind of questions we want to ask and have answered. So it's not just about a check, it's also about repairing communities. And it's also about satisfaction. Where is the apology? Where is the owning up? But the unfortunate fact is that most Americans don't know history. And so when you talk to your average white person, they'll say to you, well, I didn't have any slaves, so why should I have to pay for that? Well, you might not have owned any slaves, but the foundation for your wealth has been enslavement. And that's, I think, the point that uh, Beto O'Rourke made, I'm not a huge Beto fan, but he, that, that clip that you just played was a great clip and a great moment for him to really put this in context. So then give us an idea, what are the arguments against reparations that tend to come up? Number one, as I said, I didn't have any slaves. That happened a long time ago. And people always talk about how long ago it happened, but it may have, had, I stole your car 10 years ago, you still have a right to get your car or its value back. So you enslaved people, you did all this economic terror, you have a right now, we have a right now to have repair. Um, the other argument that keeps coming is, well, how would we do this? Mm. The pop, you know, we, it's, it's too complicated. No, it's not that complicated. Uh, NARC has a 10-point plan that talks about the things that could be done in terms of repairing communities, not just a check, but also let's fully fund our HBCUs. Let's make sure that um, Kamala Harris has an idea about making sure that more African Americans are able to be homeowners. When you look at the redlining, the systematic redlining and public policy discrimination that happened in our country, there are ways to repair that. The Federal Housing Administration redlined black communities away from getting loans. Um, the GI Bill excluded black men from getting higher education. I mean, this wasn't just, oh, people doing whatever they had to do. It was also public policy. The Congress would not pass an anti-lynching bill, even though we had thousands of lynchings. Refused to pass an anti-lynching bill, and fewer than a handful of white people were ever punished for lynching. Tulsa, Oklahoma, Black Wall Street was burned by crazy white people just because they could. 
not a single person ever tried for anything. So we, we tend to always hear this argument that, as you mentioned, that they don't know how to figure out how to work it out. What are some examples of other countries or cultures that have addressed reparations in a way that perhaps could be an example? Well, we did something with uh, the interred Japanese here in this country. I don't think it was necessarily sufficient, but it was something. I think each Japanese family got $20,000. This was perhaps two generations ago. So, we're, you know, there are possibilities. What... Uh, NARC has asked for is the establishment of a reparations authority, where just like you have a climate change authority, some other authority, where people could apply for funds to become whole. So it wouldn't, you know, there might be checks to individuals, but there'd also be repair to communities. And that's the thing that we're really looking at at NARC, is repair to communities. Looking at the psychological damage right. of, uh, of enslavement and what that's meant, how that's had a damper on wealth accumulation. But not only wealth accumulation, sister, also um, just the way we live. There's a story that I want to share with you, if I have a minute, about the lynching of Mary Turner. Mary Turner was 19 years old and pregnant. Um, a white man in Valdosta, Georgia, could not find workers because he was known to be so mean. Mm. So the way he got workers is he'd go to the prison and bail somebody out. And many of these men had been in prison for minor things, uh, rolling dice, what, minor things. But he bailed them out. And then there were always disputes about what he owed them. They had to work so many days and there always disputes. Long story short, somebody killed him. He beat a man who was sick. And a guy killed him. Um, in Valdosta, Georgia, in 13 days, they lynched 13 men, wow. Every, a, a, a lynching a day. Mary Turner, pregnant, eight months pregnant, 19 years old, went to the courthouse and said that there will be justice. They said they did not like, not like her tone, and so they lynched her. They hung her upside down, lit her on fire, and then when she was dead, slit her belly open and stomped the child. Now, this is a horrible story, right. but the bigger piece of that story is, what is the impact of this on all the people who live there? Only a decade ago did the people of Valdosta begin to talk about that. People were frightened. So when you see um, the term Uncle Tom, very compliant black people, you wonder why they're so compliant. All you have to do is look at the history of lynching. And so right. not only are we talking about economic repair, but psychological, mental health, educational, physical repair. Black it's, people it's have a shorter life expectancy than whites. And even when you control for all the crazy stuff, you know, weight, maybe cigarettes, whatever. You control for all that, you still have a, a shorter life expectancy. Some of that has to do with stress, and stress is like being black in America. And that's certainly a holistic approach is definitely needed. Thank you so much for breaking all that down for us. Julianne Malveaux there, author, labor economist, and political commentator. Thank you.